The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X Zone. A place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome back uh, to the Exxon, everyone. I am Rob McConnell, coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, on the Exxon Broadcast Network, iHeartRadio, Mutual Broadcast Network, and, of course, Talkstar Radio Network. If you'd like to send an email, exxon at exxonradiotv.com, on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV, And to find out about the programming we have available for you, 24-7, 365, just like a quickie mark, www.xzbn.net. My guest this hour is Seth Breedlove. He is a filmmaker. He has written, edited, and produced, and directed shorts and features about a variety of topics, but is best known for his production company and the films they've produced under Small Town Monsters banner. Before films, Seth wrote a number of uh, websites, newspaper, and magazines, and learned some of the skills he employs as a director while working as a reporter. Seth has also appeared on numerous television and radio shows. In 2013, Seth began working on a concept for a series titled Small Town Monsters. The first chapter in this series is the film Minerva Monster. Seth wrote and directed the film. He has since begun working on more projects which fall under the Small Town Monsters umbrella, including Beast of Whitehall, which he also acted as a director and cinematographer Uh, as well on that uh, project. In 2016, uh, Seth uh, directed and edited his first full-length feature, Boggy Creek Monster. The film is now available on DVD and through streaming services such as Vimo On Demand and Amazon Video. His website is smalltownmonsters.com. And Seth, welcome to the X-Zone. Yeah, thanks for having me. i got to update that bio. We've, we've added about three films since we made the Boggy Creek Monster movie. Well, go ahead, my friend, and let us know what they are. Uh, yeah, we, after Boggy Creek Monster, we made The Moth Band in Point Pleasant, mm-hmm. and uh, we followed that up with Invasion on Chestnut Ridge, which came out in October of uh, last year, and then we are releasing our sixth, which is called The Flatwoods Monster, wow. and... I'm producing a mini series titled On the Trail of Champ, and we are in pre production on the Bray Road Beast, which starts filming in April. So we stay busy. I see that, and congratulations to you on all your projects. Um, and I'm very well acquainted with Champ because I grew up on the south shore of Montreal. My grandparents had a, uh, a summer cottage on Missisqua Bay, which is part of Lake Champlain. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the monster stories abounded about uh, Champ, and unfortunately, I never got to see him. Where did your interest in monsters come from, Seth? Uh, you know, I, it, it's not something that I was steeped in as a child or anything like that. I got mm-hmm. into the subject later in life. I think it was probably in my early 20s when I first got into it. But I think what really drew me to it was the the fact that so many people – um, have sightings of, of unknown creatures around the world, and that um, you know, as a as as a guy in my twenties, I started hearing these stories about sightings of of the creature known as Bigfoot near my mm-hmm. hometown of of Bolivar, Ohio, which is a very small town, and that that kind of drew me into it because I was just fascinated by the idea that these sightings were happening so close to where I lived. And then, of course, the longer I was into it, the more I started being drawn toward the the kind of uh, cultural impact sightings like this can have on a rural community. And and that was kind of what led me down the road to create small town monsters. 
What is your take on Bigfoot? Is Bigfoot real? Is it myth? Is it legend? Is it primate? Is it a creature of unknown origin? Uh, I I personally fall into the camp of if it exists, it's it's some sort of unknown mm-hmm. primate. That's that's my personal opinion. But as to whether or not it actually exists, I'm still you know on the fence about yeah. about that sort of thing. I wouldn't call myself a skeptic, and and I I don't like to be branded as a skeptic, but I'm definitely I try to ap- approach all these subjects that we cover objectively, and and obviously you bring a certain amount of skepticism to every subject just to remain you know on that objective line that you have to walk as a filmmaker. Yeah, exactly. You've got to maintain that balance uh, between the three sides: his side, her side, and the truth. Mm-hmm. Um, have you ever seen a monster? I haven't. No, I'm 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 one of those boring interviews where I don't have the <laughs> you know the the terrifying yeah. story of being chased out of the woods or or any of that. I I haven't had anything terribly um, uncommon happen to us. About right. the, the weirdest thing we had happen was some audio we recorded while we were filming Boggy Creek Monster. But again, I just I haven't seen anything yet. Tell us about the Boggy Creek Monster. The Boggy Creek Monster, uh, the, the, our film is a look at the stories that inspired the, the sort of seminal 1973 B movie, The Legend of Boggy Creek, which was a film about this uh, upright, hairy creature that lived in the swamps in southern Arkansas and, and terrified locals. And um, we, we covered that story, the story of the, the inspiration for that film, but also the stories that took place after the making of that movie and, and all the sightings that occurred across that section of, of, uh, of the, the state and mm-hmm. into, even into Texas and Oklahoma and those areas right around there. Um, the film just goes piece by piece through the history of the, the Falk monster. Um, and the, the, the guide and the narrator of the film is Lyle Blackburn, who's obviously sort of the, the Boggy Creek expert. He wrote a book called Beyond Boggy Creek mm-hmm. and the Beast of Boggy Creek, and uh, it's it's just a very in depth look at the Bigfoot phenomenon as it relates to that section of the country. So, is basically the Boggy Creek monster the local rendition of Bigfoot? Yeah, and as you find out with a lot of our films, I mean, the uh, mostly what we're covering are creatures that are known elsewhere as mm-hmm. Bigfoot. I mean, we've we've stepped out of that more recently. The Flatwoods monster doesn't delve into Bigfoot stories, but but definitely the the Falk monster is their local uh, term for for their Bigfoot. Yes. Gotcha. What is the most uh, interesting monster that you've written about? That I've, um, I, I think that we've covered. I'm, I'm very fascinated by the Mothman story, and, mm, and yeah. it's one that obviously is, is in my opinion, it's sort of the classic uh, tale. I hate to call it. I almost called it a cryptid tale, but it's hard <laughs> to refer to that story as a cryptid because it's, it's so bizarre and it touches on all realms of the paranormal. So it's, it's difficult to just nail that down to like this was some sort of unknown creature but i think that's one of the things that draws me to it so so much and i i love the you know, all the different facets of the story from the men in black to the you know the the kids being chased in cars and the ufo sightings that erupted around the area and um i mean i mean definitely in terms of our films uh, that was our fourth, and we are obviously working on our sixth now. But I mm-hmm. still think that the Mothman of Point Pleasant is my is my favorite of our films, and most of that comes down to the story itself. It's just it's hard to screw that story up. It really is because it's it's so fascinating just just as a story that exists. Okay, here we are, the year twenty eighteen. All this modern technology you're using high definition cameras, a big difference from the beta cams and the other type of cameras that we all used to use in the past. And yet there's no concrete evidence that any of these monsters really do exist. Right. right. How come? And it, it's, it's, the, it's the big question, right? And, and it, what's really funny is as we release each film, the, the new trend we seem to be going through is that whenever we're releasing a film, there seems to be some sort of hoaxed photo <laughs> that, that like pops up yeah. right around the same time we're about to release a film. And all of a sudden it looks – today I got a phone call from a, a newspaper or a, a TV news reporter in Milwaukee who wanted to know if I was uh, supplying a hoaxed photo which had recently come in of the Beast of Bray Road in order to support – sort of like promote our, our the fact that we're releasing or working on that movie and i said no but i said you know honestly 
9.5 times out of 10, these photos are going to be hoaxed. So, you know, and, and the ones that aren't hoaxed might be misidentification or, mm -hmm. or maybe there's a tiny percentage that are, are legitimate. Um, but it's, it's hard to say. And, and I feel like the, the proliferation of all these digital cameras, cameras and everything mm -hmm. have actually made it harder to get to the truth. Um, because we're going to see more and more hoaxed photos. It's easier to hoax photos. Um, and it's easier to, to use things like computer graphics to really fool the public, especially when it comes to UFOs and that sort of thing. It's a little harder when you get into, you know, Bigfoot or, sure. or whatever, because you still have to be good at the, the CG effects. And, and those aren't, you know, people that are actually good at that aren't as, uh, prevalent, but, but definitely the, the UFO videos are becoming impossible to tell apart for me anyway. All right, stand by, Seth. You and I have to take a commercial break. We'll be back uh, in about two minutes from now. Exo Nation, my guest this hour is Seth Breedlove. He's a filmmaker. His website is www.smalltownmonsters.com. That's www.smalltownmonsters.com. And this is the Exxon, a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And the Exxon comes to you Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network, Talkstar Radio Network, Mutual Broadcast Network, and iHeart Radio. Seth Breedlove and I will return talking about monsters this hour here in the Exxon. Don't go away. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. Gwilda Wiaka's latest book, The Science of Magic, Book of Mysteries, Volume 1, is the first book in a series based on her writings that open every episode of The Science of Magic radio show. Drawing on the subject matter of each guest, and armed with over 40 years' experience in shamanism, 35 years in alternative health, and degrees in psychology and religious studies, Gwilda introduces relevant and leading-edge information that supports spiritual evolution and personal empowerment. Rich with wisdom and inspirational quotes packaged in digestible segments, this is a book that will pull you from cover to cover. It will also serve as a daily inspirational reading for years to come. The Science of Magic Book of Mysteries, Volume 1, is available at our website, tsompublications.com, amazon.com, and wherever fine books are sold. Back in Victorian England, a famous theologian posed a perplexing riddle. Why are the two top personalities in the Bible tagged with the numbers 7 and 11? Academics agree the answer is found in the stunning discovery of a hitherto secret Bible structure explained in a new book called The Genesis Grid. The discovery is so simple that preschool children could illustrate it. Certain claims are hugely controversial and may offend some, but at the X-Zone, we've studied this awesome new book and agree with one expert, and I quote, These discoveries appear to be beyond coincidence. So who or what hid this wonderful pattern in the Bible, and what might they do next? Find out more, X-Zone Nation, and read reviews on www.genesisgrid.co.uk. That's www.genesisgrid.co.uk.
Welcome back, everyone. Seth Breedlove is our special guest. His website is www.smalltownmonsters.com. Seth, why do you think uh, society is still, you know, still very interested in monsters, UFOs, things that go bump in the night, demonic possession, and the list goes on and on and on? I I, th- I think a lot of it comes down to the fact that we need an escape from the generally uh, poor state of the the world today, um, and and things like the unexplained right. and and bizarre phenomena are are wonderful means of escape for people, and and especially when you're talking about unknown creatures and and animals lurking in the woods behind your house. I mean, who doesn't love the idea of going out and trying to find something for yourself that, that everyone else claims doesn't exist. I mean, there's, there's no greater adventure, Mm -hmm. um, than, than that to me. And, and I've talked about this a lot recently and, and it's, it's, it's a little on the hoity toity side, but uh, you, you do wonder if there isn't a certain, um, draw uh, to this that, that reminds people of being children again, you know, of like a return to innocence where you, where you do feel like a kid who's who's out, you know, to explore and, and uncover the unknown. And, and I think there's a certain part of this that harkens back to that as well. That makes a lot of sense. It certainly does. Um, you were talking before about, um, you know, the stories that, that you've, you've heard about, uh, you know, with Bigfoot and so on. And, and you mentioned UFOs. Is there a connection between Bigfoot and UFOs? Uh, the, the film we made last October or released last October is called Invasion on Chestnut Ridge, and it's about this section of mountain range in Pennsylvania uh, where unusual activity has has taken place mm-hmm. dating all the way back to the 1960s when the, the Kecksburg UFO crash right. took took place. But we, the story that we told delves into all the bizarre activity that's taken a place along the ridge, and a lot of that activity does seem to center around – ufos and big hairy creatures um uh, you know again like personally i tend to fall more on the undiscovered primate side but there's definitely uh many reports that do exist of people seeing bigfoots and ufos in the same vicinity especially in the chestnut ridge it's funny it does seem like whenever these these things happen they they do happen in outbreaks and they're usually located in one particular area um, so you do have places like the Chestnut Ridge where UFOs are being sighted around mm-hmm. the same time as, you know, hairy creatures. And, and it, I would even extend that to Whitehall, New York. Uh, 1976, there was an outbreak of Bigfoot sightings near one particular road called the Bear Road. Um, and around that same time, there was a major UFO flap sort of erupting all around the Whitehall, New York area. So. Whether or not these things are actually connected or if it's just a, you know, crazy coincidence that mm-hmm. it's taking place at the same time or if, you know, there's there's been people like John Keel who who posit that these areas are, are window areas where, you know, possibly portals open to something, you know, and, and what comes through is what people are seeing. So they're the UFOs and and, you know, bizarre creatures might be somehow from from another realm. Why is it, in your opinion, that science really doesn't pay attention to this realm of the paranormal? I mean, in my, in my opinion, it, it just depends on which realms of the paranormal we're talking about. Mm-hmm. I definitely think there's, there's you know, searches and, and people do spend time looking into things like lake monsters and, and Bigfoot. It's not large numbers of, of these, you know, people, academia that, that actually look into mm-hmm. it. But I, I, I do think it's a bit disingenuous when we say that, you know, they're, they're, they're completely closed off to it. I don't think that's the case. I think when, when those people come to a subject like Bigfoot um, and the first thing they see are, are you know, uh, hoaxed photos of, of CG Bigfoots or guys in, in costumes in the sure. woods, or they see red circled photos of blurs, you know, hiding under bushes and, mm-hmm. and, and a whole, it, it's probably hard for those people to take it seriously. Um, but thankfully we do have people like, you know, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, oh, yeah. and Al- Alton Higgins mm-hmm. that are out there, you know, and they're, they're established, uh, you know, professors who, who have the background, um, who still take it seriously and look into it uh, from a from a you know a very serious perspective? You're a professional filmmaker. What is your opinion of the Roger Patterson film? 
I'm Bigfoot. Well, that's the that's the hard one, right? Because yeah. if if I say it's real, um, <laughs> then I say that I believe in Bigfoot, and I'm not there yet. But right. to me, I do know that when I first started getting on into all of this, I would look at that film and I would say, "Well, that's got to be a guy in a costume. It just doesn't something about it doesn't look real to me." But then you start to really pay attention to that video, and the more you pay attention to it, the more questions you start to ask yourself you know there's muscle movement and all these things that seem like they would have been extremely difficult to hoax or pull off in a fake suit especially in the 19 you know 60s or 50s and yet that that film exists and we can look at that and say there's there's definitely something to that if that is a suit that is a a fantastic suit and i'd love to see that suit if that suit exists but once again that Um, brings me back to the point with all the modern day technology that we have the ability of night vision and mm -hmm. and all the other technology how come with all the more people out in the woods these days looking for bigfoot not only in the united states and canada but around the world how come it still eludes us if if I'm putting on my Bigfoot believer hat, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm I'm saying that they they have had centuries at this point of mm-hmm. of training in needing not only wanting but needing to elude uh, you know human human beings in right. general human observation in some way. So if if this is a an eight foot tall seventy eight foot tall you know upright walking hairy primate that's hiding out in the woods. Um, I, I'm sure at this point they've seen a, you know, at least a couple of their own kind taken down by human human beings, and they know to avoid people. But how on earth they can do that for centuries on end without a body being discovered or or any of these things? Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, that's the difficult part about being who I am because yeah. I, I I want to believe. I'm like Fox Mulder. I exactly. want to believe. Exactly. You have so many questions. You know, I I. I hear where you're coming from. I've been doing this show now for 28 years, five nights a week, four guests a night. And I'll tell you something. People say, Rob, you know, why do you still do it? If you ask so many questions, you, you know, you, it's, you sound as if you don't believe. And I say, you're right. I don't believe, but I want to believe. Mm-hmm. And I'm, and, you know. And, and I, have, I, I, I have issues, too, with, even with the, the concept of like belief when it comes to this. I yeah. don't need to believe. I need to know. Like right. if, 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 you, if people expect me to just uh, put faith um, in, in things like eyewitness reports, it's just difficult for me. Um, and the word belief in general has religious connotations, which to me is bizarre when we're talking about things that most people are, are believed to be a, a physical reality, something right. that's actually there. I, I want the proof that it exists. Exactly. The proof. You know, the remember the old Wendy's commercial, Where's the Beef? <laughs> you know, I, I'd like to see the cadaver. You know, whether yeah. it's an alien cadaver, whether it's a Bigfoot cadaver or, or whatever. I don't mean to sound gross or, or anything else. It's just that with... Let's take ghosts, for example. In southern L.A., there are 1,500 ghost groups. That's just in southern L.A. And yet, with all the ghost groups over the U.S., and I think we have a database of over 13,000 of them, nothing. Yeah. Nothing has changed in the last 28 years of doing this job. Yeah, and and I mean, a lot of it is down to the fact that, that people that are doing... Uh, th- th- that are involved in this, mm-hmm. that are involved in the in the search, that are involved in the in the you know the quest to find some sort of answers. They're not they're not necessarily in it to actually find answers. And I'm not demeaning those people yeah, or saying that's a bad thing. That that this is in a lot of ways this is their hobby. Um, right. But it, it, how we're going to find answers when when 99 percent of the people 99 might be a little bit of an exaggeration but when you're talking about 95 percent of the people that are into it don't actually care if there are answers um that it's going to be difficult for us to ever find you know the reality behind most of the phenomena that that these groups exist to find to begin with you know i i've had many and i'm using uh, air quotations here ghost hunters or ghost research paranormal investigators on the show and, and i ask them well what are you going to do once you find the proof of a ghost, of ghosts actually existing. They can't answer you. Like, it's, it's, it's just like, it's all in the chase. Like, what are you going to do with a rabbit when you hunt it down? Are you going to kill it or what? And then when you kill it, what are you going to do with it? 
Yeah, and the idea that all these phenomena are are connected, mm-hmm. that they that they interconnect, um, it, that's a fascinating one too. But I'm I'm also I'm almost more fascinated with most of these things. Yeah. Uh, most you know most of these subjects, I'm almost more fascinated by what it means if if there there is nothing to it. If there if there is no Bigfoot, if there is no UFO, if there is no ghost, what what the the truth behind what's going on then in those fields is almost more fascinating because people are seeing something or they're thinking they're right. seeing something. So I, I'm curious. I'm almost more fascinated by that idea. I think we should drop it from being paranormal, um, the paranormal, and you know put it into in, instead of a paranormal phenomenon, call it a sociological phenomenon. Hmm. You and I have to take our break for the news at the bottom of the hour. Seth, thanks very much for joining us tonight, and uh, we'll be back after the news. ExoNation Seth uh, Breedlove is our guest. He is a filmmaker. His website is www.smalltownmonsters.com. That's www.smalltownmonsters.com. Seth and I will be back on the other side of this news as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Exo Nation, here's a little bit of a preview for you. February the 2nd, the February edition of the X Chronicles newspaper will be live online at www.xchroniclesnewspaper.com. The January edition was downloaded in 6,932 cities in 179 countries around the world. You, the Exo Nation, are making those numbers happen. We'll be back after this break. Don't go away. From our broadcast studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, to the world and beyond, you're watching the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. ABS Media The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State-certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. Rob McConnell here, presenting an overview for Nicholas Paul Jinnick's, author of a fascinating book, Amen. It presents facts revealed by Egyptologists, facts that enable us to understand why Amen is the beginning of creation of God. It provides recommendations for religious leaders of the major religions to unify their beliefs and teach the Word of God, love one another. Amen informs people how mankind conceived God. It was the Egyptians that developed the concepts of a soul, a hereafter, and son of God, and finally, After the worship of many gods, they conceived the belief in one universal God, the maker of all there is. 
For more information, visit www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. And welcome back, everyone. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. And you're listening to us around the world on the, let me see, Exxon Broadcast Network, Digital Broadcast Network, Mutual Broadcast Network, Talkstar Radio Network, iHeart Radio Network, and a whole bunch of other networks and affiliates. Thanks very much for joining us. Seth uh, Breedlove is our special guest. He is a filmmaker. We're talking about small town monsters this hour. And uh, Seth, while going around the country doing the many investigations, have you found that there are certain places where monsters are are more prevalent than other places that you've investigated? Um, definitely. Yeah, there's, there's, like I talked about earlier with mm-hmm. the window areas. I mean, it definitely seems like there's, there's sections of the country where they're, they're just littered with reports and, and you have places like the Chestnut Ridge where the reports are varied, um, in what is being seen. It isn't just like people, you know, like, like, you know, in Southern Arkansas, where the Boggy Creek monster is located, those reports down there, they're almost strictly of an upright walking hair covered you know, smelly creature. It's a Bigfoot. But when you get to a place like the Chestnut Ridge, the reports are all across the map of what people are seeing. It's it's UFOs. It's ghosts. Mm. It's uh, pterodactyl type thunderbirds in the sky. Wow. It's a flying dragon. They have I mean, I, the 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 reports along the Chestnut Ridge are so bizarre uh, and so varied. I really don't think I've seen another place across in in the country. Maybe something like Skinwalker Ranch, but but this is on a much larger scale because you're talking about a stretch of mountain range that's about a hundred miles long, and these sightings are so bizarre. I mean, I, I've been told Stan Gordon, who investigates those those reports, told me this past year of a sighting that a police officer had of this creature with no head. Um, that was walking around. It seemed to have eyes in its chest or something. And and I mean, that's how the, the reports along the ridge are mm-hmm. are really bizarre. Um, so there's places like that. I mean, I think definitely sometimes that that sort of thing happens, um, uh, like, like in the case of the Mothman sightings in Point Pleasant. You know, what people overlook with the Mothman sightings um, is that it wasn't just – uh, Mothman that was being seen at that time. It was it was UFOs. It was Men in Black. But there were also Bigfoot sightings happening around the TNT area at the same time. Um, so so whatever was going on in Point Pleasant seems similar to the the Chestnut Ridge as well. The, the weird thing about the ridge is that that those reports go back centuries. It's not just like those started yesterday and then they ended a week later or whatever. You know the the Mothman story was thirteen months. Thirteen a pretty finite period of time where this bizarre activity occurred with the chestnut ridge it started who knows how long ago and it's still going on today and there's no point where um there's a waxing and waning in reports now the things might slow a little here or there mm-hmm. um but but this type of activity the bizarre activity has gone on for you know like literally centuries and if anything at times it seems like it's getting more and more bizarre um, there was a point during the editing of our film. And this is the first time I've ever done this with one of our movies, but I, I co-wrote that movie with my friend Mark Matsky, Invasion on Chestnut Ridge. And while we were editing the movie, I got to a point in the narration that he had written and Mark had, had been writing about sightings of translucent caterpillars on the ridge. And I was like, you know, at this point, I might as well, I better cut this out because this might be the the point where our audience refuses to accept any more of the insanity, you know, that we're, we're sticking in this movie. So I just found it funny that with ghosts and Bigfoots and UFOs and all this, I finally drew the line at translucent caterpillars. So anyway, the, 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 quick answer is yes there's there's definitely areas around the country where bizarre activity occurs in larger quantities than others have you found a common thread in the people that you have interviewed doing the research uh, for your films are there any uh, any similarities between the witnesses well i mean i i think you could 
draw similarities, but I, I think some of that has to do with the fact that we focus on small mm-hmm. rural communities, you know, so some of these people do seem, they, they remind you of, of someone you interviewed before. We've definitely run into that, you know, and as we're prepping to make our seventh movie, that's definitely something we've sort of encountered. But, right. you know, I mean, we've, we've also, we've, we've interviewed members of law enforcement. We've interviewed, uh, p- professors, high school teachers, mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's blue collar sort of, you know, uh, factory workers. It's, it's kind of across the board as to who we're, we're interviewing. Um, and, and, and when you try to say, well, uh, you know, if you, if you're looking for like a common thread as to, well, there's some, something psychological here that could be causing this. I just don't, I don't see any evidence for that in the people we're interviewing for sure. Um, but that there's, they're so varied as well. All right. There's a lot of so-called reality TV on TV these these days. You know, programmers are just just searching and taking anything they can get, throw it on the boob tube so that they have their time slots taken. And a lot of this stuff is, in my opinion, crap. What influence do you think that these weak paranormal and reality TV shows have on uh, the public? I, I think they inform the public about the subjects, uh, which I guess you could say is a positive because, you know, even something like Finding Bigfoot, which mm-hmm. was on, on the air for seven or eight seasons, I mean, yeah. it, it, it definitely drew people back to the subject of Bigfoot. But there there does come a point where the attention being drawn to the subject is, is more than likely not the type of attention you're – sort of wanting to draw to that, you know, that subject. So I, I've just never, for me, I haven't seen shows that approach these topics, um, in, in the way I want to see them approached since the, you know, probably the early nineties, the eighties, I like shows like monster quest, of course, and that was later, but you know, I, I, mm-hmm. I loved, I loved it. I love in search of, and, oh, and even gosh, the way yeah. unsolved my- mysteries yeah. approach some of this stuff. And, and, and there just isn't that anymore. Everything's very overblown and over dramatized. And there's a lot of running and screaming and bad costumes and all that sort of stuff. And, <laughs> and very little focus on, on the original witnesses and, and what people actually saw. And, and so that, I mean, that informed, to us as to what uh, our approach That's exactly my my approach to small town monsters is what what i wanted to see in the entertainment you know that that i watch um so but but i definitely think movies we're making are, are heavily uh heavily influenced by by the shows and films i loved about these subjects as well so our our invasion on chestnut ridge film was basically one big uh love letter or or nod to unsolved mysteries and in search of have you ever been out doing a shoot, talking to a witness, and something that they've either said or shown you has just floored you and your crew? Yes. Um, during during the making of Invasion on Chestnut Ridge, mm-hmm. and this is the only – I'm not going back to Chestnut Ridge, Invasion on Chestnut Ridge so much because I'm like trying to promote it. I just – for whatever reason, we did have that incident happen while making that film. We were interviewing um, one of our witnesses, and he was – talking about his possible alien abduction um and he actually had us turn off the cameras and he proceeded to tell us all sorts of sort of little side stories things that had happened to him um following his his possible abduction and unfortunately i mean maybe fortunately for him but unfortunately for us it wasn't on camera right but he, he was he was definitely the best barry clark is his name. And he was an investigator on the chestnut Ridge during the seventies. And Barry had some very bizarre activity start occurring in his life outside of investigating the paranormal, including some strange things happening with his grandson, who was only eight at the time, his grandson, he would come home from investigating UFOs or whatever. And his grandson would tell him dad, the, or grandpa, the, the men, uh, the, the, there were visitors that came through the hole in my ceiling while you were gone and, and things like that, you know, like all sorts of bizarre bizarre activity he would see things in the mirror and things like that and it, it got so out of control that he quit paranormal investigating he dropped out entirely he burned a large number of his files and just dropped out of the field um so so he was of, of all the people we've talked to that's the only interview i've ever done where i got chills while we were talking to the person he's he could see whatever had happened to barry had affected him very deeply 
You know, it seems uh, that over the years, topics and subjects within the paranormal have come and gone. For example, men in black, you hardly hear about them anymore. Cattle mutilation, you hardly hear about it anymore. Alien abductions, you hardly hear about them anymore. My reasoning is if these are real events, we'd still be hearing about them. What's your take on that? I, th- I think in, in some of these cases, they they have dropped off the map. Uh, abductions, you definitely don't hear as much about. Yeah. I, MIB sightings, I do occasionally still still hear those. Um, but there are, I, I understand what you're saying at the same time. Like, um, we, we always talk about how so many of these stories that we're covering in our films are from the 60s and 70s. Yeah. Um, in fact, we have yet to really make a movie that focused solely on, say, the 80s or 90s. Now, when we get to the Bray Road uh, film, most of those sightings took place in the 90s. So that, so that does change a bit for that story. But, you know, out of six movies, we have yet to make a movie that focuses entirely on, say, the 80s or 90s. Uh, there might be a story here or there from those time periods. But, but mostly – these these small rural community outbreaks mm-hmm. of of like Bigfoot reports or or what have you you know the Mothman sightings in the 60s and 70s, so I'm not sure why that is. I don't know if it's just a you know if it's a lack of willingness mm-hmm. in the media to to cover it now that that doesn't necessarily seem to ring true to me because I know simply from a, a promotional standpoint for our films we've had no trouble yeah. uh, in local press in getting you know the local media to cover our films Seth, so it's, please, it's hard to say Seth please stand by you and I have to take our final break explanation for more information on uh, Seth breed love um, visit www.smalltownmonsters.com Monsters is the topic of the hour, and Seth and I will be back on the other side as we wrap up this hour here in the Exome from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't forget, check out the other fine programming available for you 24-7-365 at xzbn.net. Named one of the world's greatest psychics, Elizabeth Joyce is now giving readings worldwide via Skype. Elizabeth Joyce is recognized for her clairvoyant ability to help find missing persons, her analysis of dreams, past life regression work, mediumship, and her accurate predictions. Elizabeth has been a frequent guest on the Exxon radio show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, now for several years. For an appointment with Elizabeth Joyce, call 201-934-8986 or Skype at elizabeth.joyce. And for more information, you can always visit Elizabeth Joyce online at www.new-visions.com. The new nonfiction book, Razor of Madness, is similar to cult movies like Clockwork Orange, Dragon's Tattoo, or The Other Side of Hell. Wayne Morin Jr. and Thomas Lee Howe will expose widespread and systematic deficiencies in this thought-provoking tell-all novel. Mind control rages among scholars in law schools. Human rights are ignored while thought reform and mental manipulation are accepted practices used as behavior modification. Dr. Louis Jolion West comes to mind. Media and public scrutiny shows that United States mental hospitals are in fact destructive murder industries. Razor of Madness Expose Novel details this epidemic through an in-depth professional and personal investigation. For decades there has been a revolving door policy that still releases killers and pedophiles back into society. The maestro of mind control continues to haunt America to this very day. Razor of Madness is available in paperback or as a downloadable ebook at Amazon.com. I'm William S. Peckham. If you enjoy a good mystery with a touch of the paranormal, then you'll love my novel, From Out of the Woodwork. It's the story of a young Toronto contractor, Sean Kennedy, who buys derelict homes, guts them, and turns them into multifamily dwellings. Slums just waiting to happen. When Sean buys 29 Livery Lane, the house fights back. Former owners unexpectedly come out of the woodwork as he starts the destruction. The apparitions come to him when he touches old books, 
reads hidden letters, rummages through old boxes, finds a locket or reads a discovered manuscript of a murder mystery. From out of the woodwork, we'll take you from 1899 to the horror of the World Trade Center, September 11, 2001. Check out From Out of the Woodwork on my website, www.williamspeckham.com. Oh my gosh, Christmas already? Craig, what happened? It's supposed to be spooky, weird, out of this world. And you play us Christmas. Next year you're going to have me doing a countdown from Christmas from February the 1st. <laughs> ah, I know, Craig, these buttons can be hard once in a time. Craig West, my producer, Exonation, Nation, as you know, has been with me for 27 years, 6 months, Craig. And he looks like ZZ Top. Old hippies don't die, they just go into radio. Enough of that. Okay. Seth Breedlove is our special guest. He's a filmmaker, and his website is smalltownmonsters.com. First of all, uh, Seth, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's really been great talking to you, and I wish you continued success with all the projects that you have current and in the future. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Well, you'll have to come back on and uh, share some more stories with us in the future. Um, let me see. I was going to ask you a question here. Mm. Oh, tell us a little bit more about Champ. You know, I'm familiar with Champ. You're familiar with Champ. For the, for the listeners around the world who may have may have local lake monsters, and there's a lot of lakes around the world that have these so-called monsters, uh, tell us about Champ and why you're so interested in this Lake Champlain monster. I, I am fascinated by this story, and this was mm. this was a, a, a film. It was originally going to be a film that we made, that Small Town Monsters made. Um, but what we ended up doing was we're, we're launching this new sort of ongoing series that's going to be told in episodic format. Um, so the first season is called On the Trail of Champ. Um, and this is actually directed by my good friend Alexander Petikoff, who lives up near Lake Champlain, or cl- maybe not near, but closer to Lake Champlain than I do. He's up in the New England states, um, so he's closer to the lake. So, so it's Alex's project. But I've been fascinated by Lake Champlain and the Lake Champlain mystery for for a long time. It's basically America's Loch Ness monster. Um, but something that I, I really thought was was really fascinating about the entire thing, and, and I'm really excited to see how Alexander kind of tackles it, um, is is the long history of these sightings of a, a bizarre, like a sort of dinosaur-like creature living in uh, this this lake, this massive yeah. lake. Um, and the the sightings go back obviously centuries. In fact, all the way back to the Samuel de Champlain's actual sort of exploration of the lake itself. Um, the 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 really cool thing is is all these little sort of rabbit trail side stories throughout history. Um, there there was apparently a, a sort of an organized monster hunt by P. T. Barnum. To, to find uh, the Lake Champlain monster back in the, I th- you know, early, early 1900s, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but the, there were sightings and rock art and all sorts of things relating to the Native Americans in the area as well. So there's, there's this long sort of history of some sort of long-necked, uh, possibly plesiosaur-type creature living in this lake. And it, it, for whatever reason, it goes back a very long, uh, a long period of time. And that's, that's one of the things that really fascinates me. And when I say huge lake, it, it is a massive is. lake. Um, yeah, you, you know, it's yeah. better than I do actually. But, um, I've, I, I know when we were filming beast of Whitehall in, in 2015, um, I was fascinated by, by the lake cause, cause Whitehall sort of sits on the shores of, of Lake Champlain. And, and I thought it was very cool that 
Whitehall, New York, not only had this outbreak of Bigfoot reports in the 1970s, as well as uh, sightings of of UFOs, but also Lake Champlain right there as well. Uh, I kept joking while I was there that we were at some sort of like nexus of the paranormal world (laughs) uh, up in that area. But it's 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 a really fascinating story. Um, another story that you were talking about that you're that you're doing a production on, and or excuse me, that you have done is on Bray Road. Mm-hmm. Tell us about that. Yeah, the the Bray Road Beast is is our seventh film. It starts shooting in April, so we haven't even gotten to principal photography on that one yet. We're we're still doing uh, sort of post production on sure. the Flatwoods Monster. But the the story is about this this lone stretch of road outside of the town of Elkhorn, Wisconsin. Where since the 1930s, basically, people have been seeing this sort of upright walking, hair covered dog like creature um, called the Beast of Bray Road. And obviously, the road that all these sightings are taking place along is, is yeah. Bray Road. But um, those sightings actually take place much more on a wider swath of land than just Bray Road. It's just for whatever reason, there were a, a, a flap along that road in the 90s. So um, we're going to. It's going to be an interesting film for us. I I always try to challenge us with with each new project. With that one, what I wanted to do was not only sort of cover the the sightings of the Beast of Bray Road, but also cover uh, werewolf lore uh, throughout the world as as well. So we're going to take a look at sort of the history of werewolf sightings around the world and whether or not there's any basis in reality for for that you know sort of lore. So and and we're going to use the the Beast of Bray Road is sort of a jumping off point for that to some extent. Um, obviously, it'll still be a very regional sort of movie and focus on Elkhorn, Wisconsin. But we're we're kind of excited to, to branch out a little bit and, and do something a little bit bigger than what we've done before. Do you have any ident- uh, ideas or, or hypotheses on what uh, Champ could be? And if it is a plesiosaur, how has it lived so long? Yeah, I mean, it's if it's a plesiosaur, there's got to be some sort of uh, family sustainable, yeah, sustainable population. Exactly. Of these things, and when you're talking sustainable population, I mean, what is that? Is that like fifty of them? Is that a you know, like I I don't even know how many would have to be in that mm-hmm. lake, and then then you get into the question of well, how are they, how are they staying hidden? Yeah. You know, or they're it, it's it's really one of the the great mysteries for me obviously there's there's theories like it's it's a large sturgeon um it's some sort of eel that's in the lake um there there's there's any number of theories about it but you know and and the the expedition that alexander was actually on um last summer to film um, he, he th- that series will actually take you into the waters and out with the explorers mm-hmm. as they they try to find some sort of answer to all this champ stuff. Um, but that was actually one of the better uh, funded expeditions into Lake Champlain to find this creature. So there were multiple boats on the water. They had all sorts of camera equipment. So it was really a well-funded expedition to get, to get some answers. But as to whether or not they found any answers, you'll have to wait to, to see the show, obviously to find out, but Mm -hmm. there's, there's any number of theories, but it's, it's hard to come back to come up with anything without, uh, like you said earlier, without a body. Right. You know, here in Canada, including Lake Champlain, we have, uh, uh, Erie Pogo of Lake, uh, of Lake, uh, Lake Erie. Then there's Barry, there Barry Bay, Barry's Bay Monster, up in Barry, Ontario. Ogopogo, of course. Uh, then in the Quebec Lake of Memphis, Magog, there's also a lake monster, and there are reports of even a monster that lives in the in the Bowl area of Niagara Falls. People have been reporting, uh, seeing strange things there as well. So is is this part of the brain seeing something? Seeing A and then B and then there's a space and then it goes to D, E and the brain throws something in there just for continuity or is it real? This is, I guess, what you and your crew are trying to establish. I mean, I, I guess to an extent we might be doing that. I think for more more than anything for us is just documenting these stories and making sure that they're put in the words of the witnesses. But right. certainly some some part of it is about trying to get to the truth of the whole thing as well. And it, I mean, the Lake Monster Mysteries are all over the, the yeah. country. I, I mean, I was in Montana last summer uh, at, F- at Flathead Lake in Montana has a, 
a well-known local monster that supposedly lives in the lake here in Ohio, actually less than an hour from me. There's, there's the Charles mill Lake monster, which was this sort of, uh, armless creature with, with webbed feet that came out of Charles mill Lake and terrified these two boys back in the 1950s. Um, so it seems like there, there also might be something just about the, you know, the, uh, the, the unknown of the water or something that, that scares people. But I don't know it, when you get into psychological, you know, is, is it simply a psychological manifestation of some sort of, right. you know, creature that your brain's creating for you. I, I have issues with that to some extent because it doesn't seem to, I do understand that there, there are people, you know, that, that sort of thing happens to and there's schizophrenia and all that kind of stuff. But it seems like for, for the amount of people that see lake monsters, um, I, I would have a hard time just locking it down to that. Plus, I know a couple of people who sure. have actually claimed to see lake monsters, and one of them, actually both of them, claimed to have seen Champ. Mm-hmm. They're both completely rational, uh, sane people. One of them was a police officer. Having been a police officer myself, I know there are a lot of cops out there who have very vivid imaginations. <laughs> I believe it. Yeah. Hey, listen, uh, Seth, thank you so much for joining us. And let our listeners know where they can get copies of your DVDs or watch your DVDs online. Sure, yeah. DVDs are available through shop.smalltownmonsters.com. Um, three of our films are being distributed by a, a horror movie distributor called Terror Films. Those movies are all available on iTunes, Google Play, Vudu, Xbox, most most major mm-hmm. streaming platforms. That's uh, Invasion on Chestnut Ridge, The Mothman of Point Pleasant, Boggy Creek Monster. Um, every movie we've put out is available on Amazon. Three of them are actually available on Amazon Prime right now, so if you want to watch those three, uh, for free and you're an Amazon Prime subscriber you can check them out on Amazon Prime um, and each movie everything we put out is available on Amazon Seth take care of yourself I look forward to the next time you come back and join us with more stories of and from small town monsters take care of yourself good sir safe travels Thank- yep thanks for having me on you're welcome Exo Nation Seth Breedlove has been our guest this hour www.smalltownmonsters.com We'll be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. My name is Rob McConnell. Don't go away. Modern Esoteric, Beyond Our Senses by Brad Olson, consummates the lifeology story about where humanity originates. It is the lost continents, the primitive wisdom, the mythos of creation, and the rethinking of ancient history as we are taught in academia. There is much more to the story than what we have been told. As this is the first book in the Esoteric series, Modern Esoteric starts at the beginning of time and accelerates up to this modern age. Future Esoteric is book two in the series and takes a forward-looking position ahead of today with an open and honest examination of the ET issue and various unexplained phenomena. To discover the writings of author Brad Olson, visit www.bradolson.com. That's www.bradolson.com. Are you or is someone you know struggling with addictions, depression, anxiety, relationships, low self-esteem, lack of confidence, grief, success, and prosperity? Do you know that your subconscious belief plays a big role in the outcome of your hard work? We can help you permanently change the beliefs that may be the reason for your struggles and failures. We care about getting you the return on your investment and the results you are looking for. We can help you be free of the limitations of your past and in realizing your highest potential. We work with people by phone and Skype. For more information, visit us at www.ritasoman.com. That's www.ritasoman.com. Do you think you have energy problems in your home? 
Do you feel better when you're away than when you're home? Joey Korn is a global leader in the world of dowsing who specializes in personal energy clearing and space clearing. He can help you create an ideal energy environment in your home no matter where you live in the world. Learn about his remote spiritual house cleaning services and much more at www.dowsers.com. You can get Joey's book, Dowsing, A Path to Enlightenment, as well as other dowsing books and tools, Kabbalah books, and Walter Russell books. Joey's work is really amazing. Go to dowsers.com right now. That's D-O-W-S-E-R-S dot com or call 1-877-DOWSING. That's 1-877-369-7464.